they're there because they want to win. And that's what people remember. And it was just such a beautiful thing for, for the season. They have GW football at a program right now. Three very strange words. Less hits, less earned runs, less runs. Give me an NFL contract and I'll play two extra. We'll call it hazard. Theory. If anyone can spark them, it might be their coach, Mike Singletary. It's kind of a pillow fight. It's not going to be the end of the league because all the players are dead. The show is also unstoppable because we've still got another segment left. You, unstoppable. You, stoppable today, which is, of course, the opposite of unstoppable. Uh, who's ready to play? Hey GW Sports fans, this is Unstoppable on GW TV. You're tuned into Channel 61, coming to you from the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. I'm your host of Unstoppable, Chris Geisler, here with uh, returning champion Andrew Hanks, as always, The Rock on Unstoppable. You smell what he's cooking. And new challenger, Carla Carocha, here for the first time, Bringing, uh, bringing special knowledge and a, uh, a Magic and 49ers fan. We'll put that together. That's your first introduction to Carlo Carocha, folks. The, uh, we're, we're talking NCAA basketball, the NBA, baseball, the NHL, even MLS today here on Unstoppable. Make sure you stick around for the entire show. Starting off with uh, NCAA basketball, we're, uh, we're seeing the season kind of shake out. We're looking ahead towards March Madness. Who do we think are going to be the four number one seeds in the NCAA tournament? Uh, right now I have Kansas, Duke, Ohio State, Texas. Uh, a lot of the top four right there. Duke's not in there right now, but I think they have a chance to move up. Defending champs. Yeah, you know, with the, with the, they have good games, uh, ranked games at the end of the year. I think they move up. Out there, you know, I don't have Pittsburgh. I think they're going to fall a little bit battling the Big East. Um, and Kansas, I think they will rebound from this loss to Kansas State. I think that definitely Bill Self is not going to let that team, you know, down downfall. Like Don't they have like some teams. road problems though? You know, I mean, doesn't kind of show that they they have that home court advantage is incredible. But I mean, they, I, they've only lost two one, games yeah, this year. That it's one not, game on the road. They, yeah. They're such a uh, a good strong team with the with the Morris brothers, and um, Selby's coming back from from injury right now. And S Bill Self, you know what a great coach they have. I mean, he won the championship three yeah, years ago. So. I, I think they'll be. Wait, fine. thank you. you agree? I mean, I mean, I agree that Bill Self is a good coach. But if you look at the tournament the past two years, they were out in the Sweet 16, and then last year, Northern Ohio beats them. You know, I think that was definitely a shocker for a lot of people. I just, I wonder about you know their character come you know tournament time if they're really gonna you know pull it together. You know, they are in a good conference, but so you got instead. Uh, I, I actually, you know, Hanks brought up that, that Pitt, you know, wasn't good, but I actually have Pitt as a better team. Um, I like what Dixon is doing there a little more than self. You know, a couple stats I look at, they're fifth in the nation in rebounding, third in assist. I think that's a really good measure of playing defense and playing good team ball, and I think, you know, that, that really matters come tournament time. You know, they have Gibbs, they have Wanamaker. Um, you know, I agree on, on the other three teams. I'm just, I'm not sure about Kansas, you know, going through it. They've beaten Mizzou and you know, maybe Texas A&M, but other than that, you know, they, they did get embarrassed by, by Kansas State, so. All right, well, does, well, how much does this have to do with the, the conference they're playing in? And, and taking a look at the conferences, who do we think uh, is the, the second best conference this year behind, of course, the Big East, which is running away with everything at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the Big East is, is definitely phenomenal. Um, I, I have the Big Ten as my second best conference. Um, I think it's a little bit better than the Big 12. Um, you know, Ohio State is great. Um, you know, I, th I think Purdue is really good as well, and they have a couple really good coach teams in in that division. I think you know, come tournament time, come March, you know, good coaching will really help you. And I think you know, with Tom Izzo in that division, and you know, I know, you know, Underperform Tom, Tom, Tom Izzo underperforming the Michigan the State, he will, and yes. Michigan he will State still goes. he will still bring them around. Come tournament time, they're always ready to play. So I, I like the Big Ten. Okay. Yeah, but we haven't seen the last few years with Lucius left the team. There are problems Too internally sure. at Michigan State that we haven't seen from Tom Izzo teams, and that's coming up, and that's one of the reasons this year. I mean, it's very close, Big Ten, Big 12. I have the Big 12 right now. I mean, they have four ranked teams. Big Ten has, has three. I know, and there's a lot of underperforming teams in both leagues. You have Illinois, Mi Minnesota, uh, Baylor, Kansas State, and the Big 12. But looking at how deep these leagues are, Big 12, the, the underperforming teams, the teams at the lower end who, you know, thought would be mediocre coming in the season, perform very, very well. You have Nebraska has a 17 and, uh, and like, 12, 12 record right now. So teams at the bottom of the league, in the middle of the league, it's a little deeper league. Okay. You have 21 teams over 17 wins from the 
big time. I see that. The uh, and then uh, we had a, a a big upset this past week with uh, K State knocking over number one. Uh, Kansas right after Wisconsin had just defeated. Not so mm -hmm. big of an upset. Ohio State, who was the number one. What's the, be the best upset we've seen so far this season? Um, I like to look at Seton Hall going to Syracuse. And you see, you know, you have these teams in the Big East that are giant killers. Powerhouses. You well, know, pro well, killers Providence the last few years. Seton Hall, so it's not, you know, it's not as unexpected. Florida State but the when ACC. You, but when you, when you go into the Carrier Dome and beat a team at home like Syracuse, yeah. Jim Beheim by 22 points, that's just miraculous. What best upset of the season? Uh, it came a little bit earlier in the season in December. It's not as well known, but I have Illinois Chicago beating kind of Big Brother University Champagne. of Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very kind of David and Goliath type story. <laughs> you know, you have Howard Moore, first time yeah. coach. Oh, yeah. You know, they haven't beaten them in 21 years, and they beat them. The um, off to a quick start here on Unstoppable. Uh, talking uh, talking here with some uh, NCAA basketball. I, I think uh, I think Kansas showed a little weakness and that they can just lay an egg, but I think you make a good point. I mean, still, they, they've only lost those two games. I think they're they're a good pick to be there. Um, Pitt, I, I don't see how they, that it's just that the, the conference is so good, I don't see how they can make it through the rest of the season without losing one or two big games that can force them out of the number one seeds. They're still a great team. They might even be a top five team, but I, I, I think they're on the outside looking in there. Second best conference, I think the, the Big 12. You, you probably got it there. They had the had the number one team, Kansas, this past week, and and we'll see we'll see how the rest of that shakes out after the new rankings come out. But still, that I think that was the right choice. Um, I love that Illinois Chicago story. Um, that, that's that's simply ridiculous. And the fact the entire United Center was full of uh, was full full of uh, Illini fans and uh, in Illinois Chicago pulling off that David Goliath story. David Goliath was a good reference there. But uh, first time it goes to Hanks for uh, for two out of three. Now on to uh, NBA, uh, the NBA <laughs> fact or fiction segment here on Unstoppable. Fact or fiction, the Heat will be able to win a seven-game series against the Celtics, despite they can't beat them in the regular season. I, I say fact. Look, everybody knows come playoff time, the NBA is totally different. Teams, especially superstars, have that ability. Teams try hard. They, what, is, they, what is this? They put in effort. Yeah. It's, uh, who would have thought? Crazy. You know, I, I think in a seven-game series, you know, the Celtics, you know, are probably going to play the Heat in the conference finals, which means the Celtics will have to go through either the Bulls or the Magic to beat the Heat. I think they'll play them in the conference finals. The Celtics are they're an older team. They're very injury prone. That worries me in a seven game series. I think the Heat have that star power that they're able when they need to to, the to take over. Celtics Kendrick Perkins in the playoffs last season and did okay though. I mean, it might have been the difference in the finals. But, but if you look at the I mean, big three when KG so went out, problem, the Magic though. beat them. I, I see the, this injury prone. We're saying, oh, they're not going to beat them if they get injured. Oh, no, t if any team gets injured, if they if, lose, they can lose. If Miami anyway, loses one of the big three, the their big record three is really bad. All the yeah. big three have been hurt this season. And the record's right bad. now. And yeah. I, like, I, I look at this, you know, it's also about coaching, too. Doc Rivers over Spolstra, I think he's getting out-coached out in, these, in these games that the Celtics are winning. Rajon Rondo is a... Tri is a uh, is a threat every single game. I think that's underplayed. And I just think, you know, Bosch, what they did last game, Bosch can't win you. You can let him go. He couldn't win games at or Toronto by himself as a superstar. They're still a terrible team. They double teamed LeBron, Wade, knocked one of those out and made the other guys, you know, try to try to fill in. And I think the Celtics really have the coaching upper hand in this thing. The, uh, I mean, what tells you that they're, is it just the, the regular season they haven't tried, the Heat haven't tried, or is it just? I mean, you know, you look at regular season games, you know, yes, they have not beaten the Celtics in the regular season. A couple of those games, you know, were back-to-backs. So that's, you know, part of the NBA season. But I, I think come playoff time, these, the, the Heat have something special that they're able to, you know, really turn that switch on and, and really dominate. They have the superstars. It's a superstar driven league. I, I think that can give them an upper hand. I think they can win in seven games. Okay. The um, And uh, the NBA All-Star Weekend is is coming up and uh, always a fun feature for this time of year where it seems like there's no sports action. The uh, A few different parts of the NBA All-Star Weekend, the, the, the three-person challenge, the skills challenge, the three-point contest, the dunk contest, and the game itself. Fact or fiction, dunk contest is the best part. It's fiction. Just the last few years, they put in one one star. You know, you know, Blake Griffin's going to win this, and then a no fan vote no, alone. Yeah, no, no one else. You know, wants to wants to take the time to enter this. The last few years, we want to see stars. We want to see Blake Dwight Howard, Griffin Dwight with Howard, Dwight Howard, Howard with Dwight Howard, yeah. maybe Nate Robinson with someone else. For the last few years, you see, you get Gerald Green, Rudy Fernandez, Jamario Moon. You know, Ibaka this year, Javale McGee. 
JaVale McGee. I mean, JaVale McGee, Shaboy, that's, JaVale all he can, McGee. that's all he can really do yeah, at the exactly. Wizards. But it's just, you know, I'd rather watch the game, see the stars, okay. see Shaq dance. See the jerseys. The, see the, the, oh, the Shaq dance. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying you like the All-Star game to see the jerseys and watch Shaq dance? Yes. I mean, yes. the, the All-Star game is so boring. Nobody plays defense. It's Nobody just tries. The whole time. It's just Harlem 162 to 158. It's it's That's, not that is awesome. it's not <laughs> competitive at all. You know, I, I think the three point contest is dull. You know, I know you know maybe the dunk contest isn't realistic, but it's exciting. It's fun. These guys are creative. You know, you get people amped up. You get the crowd involved. I think a lot more with the dunk contest than you do with the skills contest, the rookie sophomore game, you know, the, the NBA All-Star game. I mean, Yao got voted in to the All-Star game. How, I mean, that's, How you know, come on. All right, uh, so we got an up-and-coming prospect into the NBA, Jimmer, the Jimmer show, <laughs> headed into the NBA. What do you, what do you think about Jimmer? Is he going to be a starter, fact or fiction? Uh, Jimmer is not going to be a star. No freaking way. This is a guy who's, who's 6'2", 190. You know, I kind of look at him as, you know, um, a Morrison type, but, but, oh, playing, no. but playing oh, right no. now. He's very good in college. Last word. I mean, I think when you have range like that, you can find a place anywhere. There's a ton of terrible teams in the NBA. Look at Stephen Curry. He's a small guy. He can Steph shoot is athletic, down. though. Uh, Jimmer, I yeah. think okay. with that range, I, I think he can find open looks, find, you know, be able to hit a shot on a bad team. Right. Short white the, guys uh, in the NBA? Oh, yeah, white guys <laughs> in the NBA. That's, that's what everybody's going for. JJ Redick. Uh, JJ J. Redick. JJ Not Jeff a starter, Redick. though. No, he's not. Um, the. Uh, uh, I, I, the Heat haven't shown that they can beat the Celtics yet, um, so I, I think that that's a tough one. And and I think the the injury bug, yeah, I think like Hank said, is is, is a little bit of a, a weak point there because the big three have been bad when one of them have been injured. Um, the game is not the the best part of the weekend. Shaq dancing might be, but I'm not <laughs> including that in the game. Um, and uh, Jimmer, I, I think I think you're right to say that that I well I think a lot of us are rooting for Jimmer. I don't I don't see it panning out for him. Segment two goes to Carlo, his first point on Unstoppable, and we're even heading into baseball. The uh, spring training is just getting underway. I'm talking uh, about the Nationals, they made a lot of offseason moves. A lot of guys going out. A lot of guys coming in. The Nats going to be better or worse than 2010? I think they'll be a little bit better. Not much. I mean, last year was a bad season. The year before was worse. But I think they can still, you know, win a few more games. Uh, worth coming in, and LaRoche are going to offset Don. So it's kind of a wash. The two guys combining will probably have Don's du- production. But last <laughs> Think about yeah. what you just said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the two guys right. they brought in but they combined had, but for they, a million dollars yeah, but, times 150. They didn't really have the options like they have with those two guys. And last year, people had the worst season of their career. Nigel Morgan, Jason Marquis. I think they'll rebound a little bit. Jim Jason Marquis, you know, is still there, but I think. He, he has a prospect of winning a few more games. He can't, they he can't be any worse than he was I mean, last year. You named Jason Marquis. They're starting two pitchers are LeVon Hernandez and Jason Marquis. That's a good starting so rotation Zimmerman. in 2003, Jordan Zimmerman. not 2011. Jordan Zimmerman's Come on, a good prospect. This is, they are not going to be better off. They won 69 games last year. You know, I think the division in the East is better Which this year. Which is the year. best since their first season in Washington. You know, I, I, I think they're taking a step back because the competition is better in the East. The Phillies are loaded. You know, they're going to steal some, some more games from Ridiculous. them. You know, I think with, with Strasburg not being the there, good, like, Bryce Harper's yeah. still a year away. I, I don't think they're better. You know, their their pitching is terrible. Their Nothing pitching is terrible. Terrible, terrible. It was terrible <laughs> last year. It's going to be worse. There's no, no Strasburg. The pitching is going to be worse. There, yeah. there's, no, there's no Strasburg. And, p- and pitching, you know, keeps you through those dog days of summer to get you wins. Yeah, it's true. I don't think they have it. It's true. I mean, I mean, John Lannon has is, is fallen to from a once a once promising pitcher to a like a fourth starter. I mean, he wouldn't even start on most teams. Like, I don't know. It's, I think one of the big keys is, is actually whether Chen Min Wong coming back from injury can actually be the pitcher he was, at least for a short time. You know, uh, in in the past, I think that, I think that'll be important. Um, Cardinals negotiations with Pujols are apparently now over, but uh, the uh, I mean, you can assume the Cardinals will try to lock up their franchise player. Should they pay him whatever he wants? Yeah, yes, yes. In a word, I mean, he's the best player in baseball. Here's a guy who's won three MVPs, two Golden Globes, been... Golden Globes. Golden Globes. He's won Golden Globes. Yeah, he's he that good of an actor. He'd like to thank Golden the glo- Academy. Golden, Golden, <laughs> Golden Globes. <laughs> Golden Globes. You know, but he's had over 400 homers in his career. He's had 300 batting average, 30 homers, and 100 RBIs for 10 straight years. So they should, this guy they should is, expect this guy that for is, 10 more? Because that's what they're looking at. If you a look nine, at the economics of baseball, it's all about that big contract. He's been underpaid these past few years. So, so I look at it at evening out. That him getting 16 mil this year is is being grossly underpaid, maybe by half. 
So if they have to cut off a couple years and, you know, maybe 50 to 60 million at the end, he's worth it. St. Louis is a baseball city. He is that team. He helps. I think he's good for baseball if he stays in St. Louis. Okay. What do you think? I mean, is there a price that's too high? Is there there a is a price that's too high. Jason Worth price? But it's a combination of this. It's a, <laughs> it's a combination of this. He wants 10 years. He's going to be, what, 42, nine, 10. You know, yeah. 9, 10, 40. 41 when be, he yeah, comes 40, out. 40, 41. He, he's not on an AL team, you know, eventually down the line. And I know they will, they will pay him. I think they'll keep him there. But they cannot pay him at the you know, best contract in baseball, keep him there as long as possible. You know, and and still have him being productive down the line. I just don't see. Is he it. the best player but in baseball? They're going to come to they're going to come to a compromise. I think he's not going to get all the money he wants, but they're going to come into a contract because you know I, I saw what we saw with Jeter here. They let him play out his last season without a contract. Worst season of his career. Both teams had an uneasy compromise at the end, so that's gonna be cheap. and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the Yankees. It's going to hurt Jeter. It's just a situation that panned out terribly for them. But it you're looks like. you're paying for Pujols to be in the clubhouse. You're paying, you know, for him to be a leader. You know, to work. You know, with Tony Larusa to keep that that squad. You know, good throughout the next few years. You know, if he's the best player in baseball, which I think can be agreed that he is, he should have the best contract that should be paid accordingly. I mean, w without him, aren't they nothing? Like, I mean, yes, uh, F Holiday. They have. Carpenter, Wainwright, one, two. Well, right, but the pitch pitching staff's decent. But I mean, the lineup. I mean, Holiday's only good because he's he's batting behind Pooh. Oh, I don't mean. think that's oh, right. Well, Those well. numbers. Well, that, I mean, that 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 argument, batting behind, isn't as realistic as people okay. think. All right. The um, the that's a, that's a tough one. I I don't think there's any way the Nats are better than they were last season. They actually performed fairly well considering what they had last season. Um, they lost uh, uh, after going twenty and fifteen. They lost. 69 out of their next 109, and then rebounded to finish like, like 12 and five, uh, 7 and 5 in their last. So I mean, they were, you know, it was a, it was a rough stretch, but they actually performed much better than the season before in every category. I think it'll be tough to expect that two years in a row, considering the the subtractions, the hammer and Dunn. Um, I think you kind of make that point by saying it took two guys to replace Adam Dunn, and they're. I mean, it's it's going to be tough. That pitching staff is just awful. Um, I, I think you're right that there is a, a, a top limit to, to what they can pay Pujols. I think they might benefit from a Jeter-type situation where he might get cheaper if he has a rough season. This is not like they want him to have a rough season, but uh, I think that could happen. Um, well, 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 that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to give it... Uh, I'm, I'm going to give it to Carlo for pointing out the woes of the Nats pitching staff. It's cause it really is terrible. terrible. It's, it is oh terrible. Goodness. It is going to be a huge... Terrible, terrible. All right. Uh, <laughs> the uh, onto the NHL. The uh, the uh, there was a serious incident last week in the NHL and in, in fighting um, and, and fighting's kind of become another topic of debate again. And as happens, seems to happen every once every year, once every two years. What should the NHL's stance be on fighting? I mean, fighting. I, I understand it's a tradition in hockey. It's you know it's part of the game. You know, and a lot of people have been saying you know if it's patrolled right it's fine but if it was patrolled right then why did this incident happen you know between the pens and the islanders you know it got really out of hand and you know the bottom line is fighting is bad for the league's image when it gets out of control like this you know for all sports talking about player safety to have people take off their pads and throw punches at each other you know it it doesn't look good you know so i think better enforcement should be the nhl standards i'm not sure what that will entail but if they were doing it right this incident would not have happened the, um, what do you think? I mean, I agree with you totally with that. It got out of hand. You know, it was heated. They're on the same conference with the Islanders and the, and the Penguins. Islanders are not the best team. And I'm sure they, like they, were, they were. It's not like a huge rivalry game. They were, yeah, but they were, <laughs> they were destroying themselves. But I, I, they, they should have cracked down. It shouldn't have been going on the entire game. Um, you know, about the image thing, I think a lot of people think that way. But I think also, you know, people, it brings interest to sport. And I like I, I want that interest in hockey to grow because hockey I think is a great sport right. and it's, it's fun to watch live, um, but it was a little excessive, yeah. So the so what, what you're saying though is, is that the only the only North American soccer I mean the only North wow the only North American sports soccer league well, yes the <laughs> the North American sports league that allows fighting hockey should do that just because it generates interest from the fans and it's not important to worry about. Well, I mean, that's that's a tradition thing. They should continue it. Okay. You know. So because it's been I there, mean, it's part of the game. I mean, uh, is it part of the game? I guess that, that that's that's. Uh, how, how many people n knew about the Islanders here before DPHO <laughs> knew about? No, the no, Islanders. knew about. <laughs> 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 I mean, exactly. I mean, knew about their players. 
knew, knew, they, knew that where they, they were before there. DPHO got one punch knocked out in this fight. Yeah, it was excessive. That never should have happened. Apparently, they're on an well. island. Is what I don't understand. Yeah. Really. The um, so the for the Winter Classic, the uh, the NHL allowed HBO to do this very very in depth coverage, uh, like a hard knock style, following the players around, getting every kind of angle on on. They put it on HBO, surrounding the Winter Classic for 24 hours. Should they allow something like that in the playoffs where the stakes are the really high? Uh, I, I believe they should just because of the sense of the business of the NHL. They want to add, you know, interest to, to have fans more watch the playoffs. You saw last year, you, know, a lot of the, you have the NBA playoffs at the same time. NHL has such a long playoff peop, or period yeah, yeah. that they don't have as much interest. So I think it's actually a very good thing for them to bring in the cameras because that tw that Winter Classic 24-hour uh, special was extremely popular, extremely well done. I enjoyed it a lot. And I think that if they went into the playoffs, it will just be even more dramatic. It's going to be too big of a distraction to these playoffs? I mean, I mean, that's my point, that, you know, they do hard knocks. They do it in, you know, training camp, in yep. preseason, you know, where these guys are preparing yep. for the season. Come playoff time, there's enough distractions as it is in any professional sport. To have a camera crew on there, you know, constantly scrutinizing you, it's going to be tough. On, on players and I mean you know while Hard Knocks was successful it made the Jets look really bad because they were dropping F-bombs left and right and, and there was a lot of commotion in the NFL about you know how the league is portrayed you know I don't know if that's necessarily the case with the NHL but you know some guys just you know might let some things fly HBO's not censored you know are you you know taking away from a kid who's looking at hockey and he goes oh wow you know, are, are the parents going to be what, upset? What about if there's a team that volunteered? So, for instance, or, so you've got like a, like an owner who wants to generate interest, and he says, "Well, our team will gladly do it to to try to pick up more fans and more interest." Is that okay? I mean, I I guess it's it's okay. I just you know wonder if you're going to be a playoff team, you want to take winning seriously, you want to take that team mentality seriously. I think this detracts from that. Okay. The um. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a tough one to say. I think you're right about the, the I think you make the correct point about the tradition of fighting. And, uh, and, and, and that it's, since it's always been there and it's part of what the fans go for at this point because it's part of the game, even if it gets out of hand every once in a while, it's something that, that should still be there. But you're right, it got out of hand um, and it happens every once in a while and that's unfortunate. But I think you're right that it, it should stay and it definitely keeps all of us a little more interested in the game. The, uh, I think you're also right that they could possibly do, you know, this uh, expanded coverage for the playoffs. I think that'd be interesting. The NHL seems to struggle ever since leaving ESPN for attention. So uh, I think that's something to that generate attention. I think that's a good thing. 2-2, Two -two, headed into a decided fifth segment here on Unstoppable. Talking MLS, which is a, a rarity, a little uh, soccer here on Unstoppable. That's why you tune in. The uh, DC United has made a lot of off-season moves, and SGW students were were able to follow DC United closely, heading out to RFK Stadium. What was DC United's best off-season move? I think it was getting Dax McCarthy, the um, you know midfielder. Dax is an incredibly good. Player. I know as there's his national player, and the way they got him, you know, you saw Ben Olsen coming in and actually you know taking taking the front and. And moving this club forward, they went in. They got him by training, you know, Perkins to Portland, and got him from uh, where did he come from? Houston. Houston. I know, just out of, out of nowhere. Houston didn't protect it him in the expansion draft, and the Timbers picked up Rodney Wallace. It was a three-way deal. Yeah, Rodney yeah. Wallace. Went away. It was a just very, it was a very heads-up move, very great move yep. to shore up this, you know, midfield. midfield yep. is, you know, bring in another scoring option. I think it was one of the best moves that that gets overlooked of right now because of what just happened. It moves Clyde Sims to the bench, which uh, which is probably which is probably a good call. Clyde Sims is solid, but not the not the greatest option. What do you think of DC United's best offseason move? I mean, it's got to be Charlie Davies coming. That's over. all the attention Co coming on loan. And this is a guy who's an absolutely electric player. I mean, you know, b before his injury and he was head out of the World Cup, he was going to be a starter for the U.S. team, a guy with a lot of promise, still very young. You know, I, I think, you know, in terms of DC United and the MLS, it's good, definitely on the business side, and then definitely, you know, on the pitch, it's, you know, if he's, he if he's healthy, if he's rehab fine, which I think, you know, he'll be okay. 
know, he, he scored a lot of goals when he was in France. I think I think this is definitely good for DC. I mean, United. his team in France what, likes him. Yeah, what, what I think, though, about Charlie Davies, though, is that because they were first in the allocation list, this was all set up for him. It was just a, a about going and getting him and getting the interest. What they did with McCar with Dax is that they went out and they found him. They, they got the options to trade out Perkins, get rid of bad players, and bring in a star who's going to shore up this this team. You got rid of Perkins' salary too. And yeah, Perkins and I think it was a great move on, on on dropping unproductive players or players who are you know burning the team and bringing in uh, good talent out of nowhere, out of this uh, the, this the expansion draft or the the draft. And with Davies, yeah, he is a more electrifying player, better known player. Probably going to be a star. Yeah. yeah, probably going to be a star. But like I said, it was it's I mean credit DC United, but it was set up for him. You know, they just needed to go get him. They went out of the woods, out into the woods to get McCarthy. The, uh, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with Dax McCarthy. And then Dax McCarthy really impressed in that USA national team game. Uh, and he could do bicycle kicks. A few weeks ago. Yeah, that was, <laughs> was awesome. Really not yeah. like Wayne Rooney. No, no, too no. soon. Way, <laughs> nice bringing Wayne too Rooney soon. next. Maybe, why for, not? For Wayne Rooney. You know, it's funny. When they waived Julius James, um, the uh, they, they opened up. Money for another international spot. It's it, it's what what is DC United up to next? Is is, is my question. It's been a crazy crazy off season. Let's see. Um, there's a, a few USA national team players. The best example is probably Josie Altador, who are struggling to get playing time overseas. Is the MLS a good option for them to come back to America, get consistent playing time because it's not the highest quality league, and then regain their form and then head back overseas? Is that is that a good option? I mean, it, it is a good option, but you know the level of competition, like you said, of the MLS is not there. I mean, the way I look at it is, is it d depends on how you're grading them. I mean, these guys have families; they have to. You know, it sounds selfish to say they have to take care of themselves, but they're not getting paid money here that they would overseas. Over in Europe, that's absolutely and, true. And and that's something that needs to be taken note. That you know, while more playing time is helpful, you can still learn a lot if you're on the the bench for Sir Alex Ferguson for some of these great managers. You know, in Europe, that you know these guys need to you know. Pay me my money. You know, they, they, they need to take care of themselves, and they can still get exposure and still help the national team when it's time to play. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, it has to look at, you know, the players, but I think it's like Charlie Davies, young guys, if they're not getting much playing time, it's good for them to come. It's like, you know, no, uh, sorry, MLS, but like the NBA development league, you send a guy down because oh, you, no. want, you want them, you know, to get the reps you want them to, to develop. And then, you know, bring him back after a year. And older guys, it's also good veterans to come back to MLS if they're, you know, going down. Jada Merritt, middle, for the, example. Jada Merritt has the, the middle of the pack guys, though, you might want to stay in the bigger leagues, you know, get for development for issues, get paid. Yep. So I think young guys, old vets, um, middle of the pack, up-and-comers maybe stay in Europe. Okay. The... Um well, that's a, that's going to be a tough one. Uh, Charlie Davies generated all the attention, and that's uh, and that that's a, an incredibly important thing to consider. However, I think you were right to go back and point out that it was the way in which they got Charlie Davies that made. It. I mean, the way they got Dax McCarty is 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 the the, the what makes that the best offseason move. And the way he's going to, I mean, what DC United was missing was a player that could string together the defense to the offense, and that's that's hopefully what Dax McCarty will do. Um, I think you make uh, I think you make the right point as well about uh, it, it, it's, it takes a certain type of player those old vets um, coming back those those young guys staying in MLS or coming back to MLS um, I think you make a fair point that it's good to be on a good manager's bench but I don't think it's it's good at all for Josie Altador to be sitting on the the bench at Villarreal or uh, or Freddie Adu to not have any club to play for because nobody will pick him up I think they got to swallow their pride. Come back to the United States for a little while. But, uh, but I think Hex will take that fifth segment, giving him a 3-2 victory this week on Unstoppable. It was a good fight, Carlo. Noble fight, but uh, falling to the champion, Andrew Hanks. Wrapping up the show this week with Rapid Fire. Spring training, like we said earlier, underway. Is spring training really important to the 162-game, really long regular season? I think it is. I mean, they need to look at these players, see who they're going to have as role players, bench players, and also, you know, get the guys into rhythm. So I think it's a very good thing. So would you tell me, like, in September, though, that, like, they're really thinking back to spring training? And oh, good, no, it's, it's not about good thinking thing. back. It's, it's about thing. getting started. Right, you got to, they have an okay. off season. They got to get back into the flow of things, make sure everything's right. Because, you know, if, if, if in your division you're going to win by one or two games, these games matter at the beginning of the season. Yeah, this is a professional sport. This isn't, you know, kickball where you go drinking afterwards. You need to prepare. <laughs> you need to get ready for this kind <laughs> of thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yes, you know, you know it seems Adult long kickball, with, with 162 games after that, but you absolutely need, you know, spring training to get ready. Daytona 500 coming up. Who's our preseason picks to win the NASCAR Nextel Sprint Cup? 
I mean, I don't know much about NASCAR, but I know Jimmy Johnson wins is, everything. Wins yeah. everything. And has killed the sport all, by winning all, everything. All he does is win, win, win. No matter you know, what. It, it, could be, it could be five in a row. You know, but if if not him, you know, I think Jeff Gordon's due, honestly. It's been a long you know, time. You guys, He's already you got, got guys four, like Denny Hamlin, you know, uh, Kevin Harvick who could do it. But Jimmy new, Johnson is so Kevin good. Harvick's new car is beautiful. They just give beautiful. Jimmy Johnson the trophy. It's already set up. It's already, uh, it's already share done. with someone. Someone he, else will okay. come up. I think I have a co-winner. but somebody yeah, a co-winner, but, but he's, he's has, already, He has know, to be holding the trophy. His name's on there. Okay. Gotcha. And still talks of an NFL lockout, even with good news coming up that the teams are heading towards, that the teams and the owners and players are heading towards mediation. But would a lockout really hurt the NFL in terms of TV ratings, or people just can't wait for it to come back? I mean, it's such a popular, you know, encompassing sport in this country. I think it'll absolutely still be popular. I mean, it will hurt. Will it, take a hit? it will. It will take a hit. You know, people are going to want to see their stars play. People are going to want to see their teams play. It's going to be. It would be a very strange season, I think. I mean, the NFL's been, you know, as popular as it's ever been. I think, you know, with all these labor talks, it has nowhere to go but down just because of the negative image. You know, people are either going to think the owners are greedy or the players are greedy, but either way, it's not good. I think, you know, TV ratings will drop a little, they'll still be strong. I think, especially with ticket sales and merchandise sales, going to drop big time because, you know, that's... Are people going to hold the owners responsible for this lockout or the players? Uh, that's my thing. It's A lockout is the owner's thing. It's not the player's thing. I mean, yeah. who are people going to hold? People are like, the players are just asking for more money. I mean, it's that's a tough thing. Uh, to, we're, we'll, we'll see how that fans out. Well, thanks for coming by, Carlo. I appreciate having you on the show. Um, Andrew Hanks, Unstoppable, once again this week. That'll wrap it up for us. I'm your host, Chris Geisler. We'll see you back here in a few weeks. Stay tuned to GWTV for more programming.